You missed the lapel, Mike. <laughs> Days like today. Move around and talk at the same time. Of course, that's probably not a good idea for me. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that song, Pat. It makes me think of the, the miracles of my life in, in this church. And I've been here for almost 19 years in, in this church. And, uh, and the miracles just touch me when you sing this song. Amen. It's not going to be one of these days, y'all. I'm not going to cry today. Don't cry. You're crying. Anyway, uh, I do have a sermon. And I kind of borrowed the sermon. Of course, you know, there's nothing new under the sun. So everything we do is kind of already been done. And uh, the Pearl of Great Price is the name of my sermon today. And I want to, uh, I, want, I wanted to, uh, I want us to understand a little bit more about the righteousness of Christ and a little less about our self-righteousness, <clears throat> which I got plenty of that. I mean, the Lord's still working on me. Just songs like that that bring, bring it more to my attention. Thank you, Pat, for allowing the Lord to use you to touch my heart today. I need that. I need that touch. <coughs> used to when somebody was coughing like that everybody would look around and say, you know you got a mask on COVID. anyway that reminds me of, of what I was thinking about this morning uh, the human race God made one race Amen. Satan is taking that race and he's divided us and uh I don't see race as a color. I see race, I see the human race. And I know that's not what God intended it to be, the human race. And I think that skin color is, is, is just that. It's only skin deep. Amen. You know, we, uh, <coughs> the Bible says in Acts 17, 26 that we were made from one blood. The whole human race was made from one blood. When he made Adam, the whole human race was in Adam. I, uh, I love preaching about that. I can never get rid of it because it makes perfect sense to me. Now, when the human race was made, of course, we were all encapsulated in Adam. And I was thinking this morning, how can I explain that? I've always tried to explain how God put the human race. Thank you, Kyle. Is this for me to dry, to dry my eyes? <laughs> Tell you what, I'm crying. But thank you. I can, that's probably a lie because anything can make me cry. <clears throat> anyway, when, like I said, when God made the human race, the, the whole human race, was in every, the DNA for every person was in Adam. And that, 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 that's. That speaks for itself. I was going to try to expand on that a little bit more. but um, If you took a bowl, and this is, I'm just trying to simplify it. If you took a big bowl, you fill it up with water, and if you drop dye into that water, you drop a drop of dye in it, and it starts to permeate through the whole bowl. When something touches the human race, it permeates the whole human race. We don't realize it that when when one of us is touched, really, the entity, the, the, the corporate humanity is touched. Just think about uh, coronavirus. You drop one little coronavirus in that, in that what is it? It permeates it, it. It affects us differently, but we all get touched by it. And what I'm leading up is, is the greatest thing that God has given the human race as His Son, Jesus Christ. When, the, when He decided to infiltrate humanity, how did He infiltrate? Most countries, when they raid another country, they send their whole military out. 
Well, God sent a child to infiltrate the, the human race. When the Holy Spirit infiltrated Mary at the Incarnation, that's when Christ became a human being. And we're talking about this, we're still thinking about this bowl. When Christ was put into that bowl, it permeated to the whole human race. We call that justification. We call that, uh, Romans 5.18 uh, explains it a lot better. I'm not going to go to the verse, but Christ touched the whole, Adam touched the whole human race because he was the human race. Adam means mankind, if you look it up in the Hebrew. So Jesus comes along and he touches the whole human race. That's called justification. There's two phases of justification. I, I've been racking my brain how to explain two phases of justification. One is when Jesus saved the whole world when, at the Incarnation. The whole world has been saved. But does that mean everybody's going to be in heaven? No. Because the whole world doesn't believe it. Amen. There's an experiential side of justification. And that's the side that, that I would like to, to present. And we're going to talk about the, the pearl of great price because I, I think that kind of illustrates what's going on. I'm going to try not to read too much, but I'm not going to make a promise today. I, I usually, I like to talk. I don't like to read. But I, I, I like to talk. But the information given is so important that if I, if I try to go from my memory, I'm going to leave a good part out. And I think we need the, the touch of all this. Uh, Self-righteousness is, is permeates the human race. You know, when a, when a football player scores a touchdown, he goes in and he starts dancing around and, he, and he's doing his thing and he says, look what I have done. But he forgets that every cell in, whole, in his whole system is permeated with Jesus Christ. Every cell, every living thing is, uh, has the power of God in it. It's not God, don't get me wrong, I don't want to get into pantheism, and it's not God, but it, but everything that is alive has the power of God in it. Every atom, every little thing that you see with and everything you see is held together, is held together by the Lord Jesus Christ. If you took that equation, if you took Jesus out of that equation, we would cease to exist. When we talk about... Uh, Self-righteousness is, if you, if you look at it from the way I'm fixing to explain it, it is, it is scary. And I want to talk about the parable. Um, it's in Matthew 13, I believe it's verse 45. Oh, I'm sorry, it's, it's chapter 12. And it's in... Uh, Starts with verse 43, 44, and 45. It says, When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest and finds none. Something has, has got this spirit out of this man. Maybe uh, self will. Maybe he decided to quit smoking. Maybe he decided to quit drinking. Maybe he decided a lot of things. He, well, well, the spirit left him. And it says, Then he says, I will return to my house which I came. Wait, let me let me start over. When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest and finds none. So then he says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it empty, swept, and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of the man is worse than the first. So shall it be with this wicked generation. The house was clean. The man or the person was self-righteous. Without inviting a divine occupant to come into the clean place, Eurus, for the lack of a better word, my words are lacking me. You're a sitting duck. Mm. You have no defense, no defense against the powers of Satan. 
There's no hope for you. So this is self-righteousness. The self-righteous person can be, there's two powers in this world. You serve one or you serve the other. We, have, we do not have the strength to overcome. Even sinless Adam and Eve fell to Satan because he's so cunning, he's so crafty. I, I don't want to give him glory, but God made him a perfect specimen. Satan, the spirit of prophecy tells us that was the only thing he lacked that Jesus didn't have. I mean, the only thing Satan lacked that Jesus had was Jesus' divinity. Satan was not divine. He was a created being. That's an incredible thought. All right? but look it up in the spirit of prophecy. Anyway, don't believe what I tell you. <laughs> look it up. Don't believe anything I'm telling you. You should look it up. You should. These things should be in you. And, and all I can do is sit up here and give you information. Because when you when you walk out of here today, you might think, you know, I won't tell you what you're going to think. But anyway, you're going to forget this sermon. So you got to go home. You, you look at the bulletin. You you think about it. So. I'll move on with the sermon. I got this from a little book. If you want to name, know the name of it, I'll tell you later. The, uh, the reading for the day. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. That's Matthew 13, 45 and 46. Uh, let's, let's be in a spirit of prayer. Father, we thank you so much that we could come before you. And I pray that you would be with us, that we would do things in accordance to your will, that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit, that we could gain a blessing from the information that you have given us through your word and through the spirit of prophecy. Father, we thank you and we praise you and we want to give you all the glory. And it's in your precious name we pray. Amen. 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 The Spirit of Prophecy has two definitions for the pearl of great price. And, and it, it seems like there's a conflict between them, but let me explain. Uh, this is from Christ's Object Lessons. Christ himself is the pearl of great price. The righteousness of, of Christ as a pure white pearl has no defect or no stain. I want to say that again. The righteousness of Christ as a pure white pearl has no defect or no stain. And the other is Christ himself is the pearl of great price. i got to get rid of some of this stuff. I need a bigger pulpit. I don't think that's going to happen. We had a big one up here. No, that Paul, we, that Paul, I, I was, I was in the Pentecost, I was in the Presbyterian Church, and we rented this building uh, like 30 years ago. And it, it's to tell you a little bit about myself, where I've been. Well, this guy was, he was, uh, he was meant, he, he wasn't mentally challenged, he was physically challenged. And this pulpit, you know, y'all remember the big pulpit that was up here? It's out there. He, this guy, he stood back, and he run to that thing and he, and he didn't even move it. He says, he says, that's what I like. He says, some of these pulpits, he says, I'm going to end up down there one day. I'll never forget that. That was, that was kind of, that's how he started his sermon. He had my attention then. Anyway. Spirit of prophecy has two definitions for the pearl of great price. And we, uh, I mentioned those. Christ is the pearl of great price and the righteousness of Christ is a pure white pearl. has no defect, no stain. And that's from Christ's Object Lessons 115. Try not to get lost. Ray calls this dead space. <laughs> 
The righteousness of, of God is embodied in Christ. Now, when you think about that, the righteousness of God is embodied in Christ. Righteousness, uh, that's the part I was going to, I'm glad I thought about that. Uh, I'm not, can't get away from my mic, but I'm not going to do this. I'm just going to talk about it. That, no, it's okay. That chair right there, how I've seen righteousness, justification in righteousness explained is uh, that big pulpit we had. That chair was taken and leaned up against the pulpit. And if you know what, everybody knows what uh, justification is, in, like in uh, Word, you know, you can justify things in, in Word. Well, it's an old print term. Well, if that chair was leaning here and I sat in it, when it was leaning, I could break the chair. So one of the definitions of righteousness is right doing, for one. And is set things at, at one minute. Uh, justification set things at one minute. What I would do is I'd take that chair and I would set it straight and that I would, I would be justifying that chair. I would set it right. That's, that's kind of what the meaning of justification is. Is it, is it set right? So, righteousness, you can look at righteousness, the word is right doing. And it says righteousness of God is embodied in Christ. Right doing is righteousness. Christ is the right doer. That's the best way I can put it. Christ is the right doer. We receive righteousness by receiving Him. When Christ was put into the human race, into the bowl, it permeated the human race. But like I said, not everybody believes. They don't believe it. That, that it, won't anybody be in heaven because they weren't forgiven for their sins. Everybody's sins have been forgiven, but not everybody believes that. You can talk to me about it later. I see some eyes looking at me. Okay, the key is this, the key is Matthew 13, 45 and 46 is how whoa. 45 Matthew 13, 45 and 46 is how the merchant man obtained the pearl. He sold all that he had and bought it. And this this is in uh, and this this verse is in red. So this is what Jesus is teaching us to sell all that we have and to buy the pearl, the great pearl. In the book of Revelation, well, that, that sounds kind of worldly, doesn't it? I mean, when you think about purchasing something, buying something, uh, the, the, the buying the pearl, which is buying righteousness. Did I tell you not to get you run ahead of me too far? <laughs> Give me a chance to 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 bring this bring this back around because that that it just doesn't it conflicts with our thinking with our with, especially biblically. Okay, Revelation one five tells us about the faithful witness. Who is the faithful witness? Jesus. And in uh, Revelation chapter 3, starting with verse 14, it talks about the Laodicean church. And I want to read uh, Revelation 3, verses 14 to 18. It says, if you want to follow along, it says, And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, Talking about Jesus. The beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would I work. I would I would thou work cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. And some there's if you look all this up in the Greek. And it, it, what, it's, what he's saying, he says, I'm about to spew you out of my mouth. It doesn't say he spews us out of his mouth. He says, I'm about to spew you out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And knoweth not that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire. He says, buy. Purchase that thou mayest be rich and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed 
that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thy eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. Now I've got a saying, I can see if I can get this right. It's not, our problem is not that we're so blind. Our, our biggest problem is that we think we can see. Well, maybe not your problem, but that's my problem. Is, is I get to where I think I know what I'm doing, and well, then I fall flat on my face, and God says, uh, He picks me up, He dusts me off, and He says, I still love you. And He gives me a little push, and I, and I keep going. The Spirit of Prophecy says, and this is uh, Volume 7, and everybody knows that Volume 7 is the comments of Ellen White. And this is page 965, and it, this is in your bulletin. I'm not going to read it all, but it's in the in the bulletin. In the, in, yeah, actually, it's uh, on the back. Oh, wait, I guess that's the back page, the back two pages. But I'm going to read just just very little of it, and I'm going to skip around. It says several times on the, that page, Ellen White, and she's talking about uh, the righteousness of Jesus. Thus again tells us that. We by his righteousness. Thus Jesus again, Jesus says, thus Jesus again tells us that we by his righteousness. And it says, I'm going to skip on down. It says, the great vendor of spiritual riches and is inviting your recognition. The Savior comes with jewels of truth of the richest value and distinction from all counterfeits that all that is spurious. He comes to every house, to every door, he is knocking. So Jesus is knocking on the door of every every person. And he's presenting the priceless treasure urging, buy of me. Jesus is going from door to door, standing in front of every soul temple, proclaiming, I stand at the door and knock. As a heavenly merchant man, he opens his treasures and cries, I of me. There it is again. She says this several times through this page. And one more time. Uh, this is August the 7th, 1894, from the Review and Herald. It says, Open your doors, says the great merchant man. Who is the great merchant man? I don't want y'all to go to sleep. Jesus. Amen. The post. The post the possessor of spiritual riches and transact your business with me. He's inviting us to transact and do business with him. That's kind of foreign to us when we think about doing business with Jesus. It is I, your Redeemer, who counsels you to buy of me. It says, your Redeemer. And let's think about what I was talking about, the football player doing the touchdown. You know, uh, who, does, who do we belong to? By creation, we belong to God by creation. And the other thing is that we need to remember how much Jesus loves us and redeemed us. He is our creator and redeemer. He, he created us first, and then we turned our backs on him. Uh, we hung him on a cross. And then he forgave us, and he became our redeemer. I love that creator-redeemer thinking when I'm alone and by myself and I'm thinking about things like that. And you, it draws you closer to God when you think, well, He made me. He owns me. Why don't I give myself to Him? I mean, that, that just makes perfect sense. I, it's not that simple. I mean, it is that simple. Really, you think about it. Amen. Amen. Jesus presents himself as a door-to-door -door salesman. It's like, okay. The great vendor, a heavenly merchant man, is selling. He urges, he seems to, he seems to urge Laodiceans to buy these precious treasures from him, one which is righteousness, the white raiment. In, in thinking of something else I left out in the beginning, I, I, I didn't write, I wish I'd have wrote that note down, that Jesus is in the embodiment of the Ten Commandments. And, and, and what, I, what I want to do is expand on just one of them like Jesus expands on 
the seventh commandment. He says, if you look at a woman with lust and you've created adultery in your heart, what Jesus is saying is, or what he did was he expanded, he expanded width and depth to that commandment. It wasn't just, you know, do not commit adultery. It says if you think about it in your mind, there's, there's depth and width to every one of those commandments. And, G, and, and the Ten Commandments are a, trans, are a transcript of, of, the, uh, of God. They're, they're a transcript of His character. I mean, we could, you know, just look at each commandment and say, yeah, he, you know, he's, and, and, and box him in with, with, with just, you know, thou shalt not commit, or thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not lie. But these commandments have width and they have depth. And when we see Jesus, we see the Ten Commandments with the width and the depth. It's who He is. <clears throat> the transaction, this comes from, I don't know where that comes from. The, the Desire of Ages, page 347. Now, this is an incredible reading from uh, Desire of Ages. And if you've read Desire of Ages, you know what I'm talking about. This is page 347 of the Desire of Ages. It says, The wandering crowd that, packed, that pressed about Christ realized no accept, accession of vital power. This is when the woman that had an issue of blood for, I forget how many years, 12 or 18, 12 years? 12? And it comes up behind Jesus and it says, But when the suffering woman put forth her hand to touch him, believing that she would be made whole, she felt the healing virtue. So, so in spiritual things, to talk of religion in a casual way, to pray without soul hunger and living, without living faith avails nothing. I mean, just think of all those people that were around Jesus. And this woman just Touches, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, if I could just touch it, that is that is real faith. Can, if I can just, and he felt the power go out of him. He felt that uh, the power go through him and out of him. It's an incredible thought that 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 Jesus is inviting us to have that type of faith. Now I, I gotta hear this. I'm gonna lose it. Um. Oh, you recognize that car. I said, I want to go to cry. I love this car. I love all the cars that I got. But our friend Raymond, you know, and, and I, uh, I, I, you know, Raymond kind of spoiled me. And he spoiled a lot of people because he did all our thinking for us. I shouldn't say that he did our thinking for us, but Raymond did the study. He did the footwork. He did everything. And if God, you know, and I don't know why God took him. I have no idea, and I'm not trying to say that he took him for this reason. But if God, I, and I know that there, there's a story of a man over in another country, uh, Romania. And he was telling about his dad. His granddad lived to be 103. Well, his dad only lived to be like 50. But... He wouldn't quit passing Bibles out. It's against the law to pass Bibles out. And his dad would not stop and the police threatened his life. He said, hey, you can't kill me. I'll just, you know, I'll rest until Jesus comes. And uh, they said, well, we'll take your, your, your money. He says, I gave it all to the church. He says, well, well, we'll take your car. He says, that belongs to the church too. He, they could not persuade this guy to quit passing Bibles out. And what they did to him to, to shut him down, they put him in a room with radioactive material. And he didn't know. Well, he got radiation poison. And he was dying, he knew it. And his son came to him, he says, Dad, you have so much faith with God, ask him to heal you. And he says, son, he says, I'm doing all the work. He says, God needs me to get out of the way so somebody else will step in. So more people will step up. And, and that makes sense to his son. And, I mean, it doesn't make sense to us always why God you know, takes certain people out of our lives. 
and while, while we have sicknesses. We, we need to be careful how we pray when we ask God to remove something out of our lives because we may be removing the very thing that God is, is using to, uh, to tether us into a certain place. You know, if you've got that pain, it, it, you know, some people live in constant pain. I don't know why. Only God knows that reason. But you can find comfort in God is using it to, uh, to tether you in a certain way.